Good evening and Merry Christmas. Welcome to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Although it is four o'clock in the afternoon and uh, the candles are lit, but uh, the sun is still giving us a lot of sunshine at this point in time. But uh, um, there are cook reassured me the sun will go down, so we're excited about that. It says in Matthew chapter 1, beginning uh, reading in verse 20, 22, And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, and she shall give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, today we celebrate the birth of that child, the one that is called Emmanuel. And tonight, uh, we are going to begin our service with the um, first of the, or the final lighting of the Advent candle. And uh, we're going to have one of our families here at the church, uh, Mike and Maria Jansen, come at this time, and they are going to light the Advent candle for us. Sadie, thank you for lighting our Advent candle. You see the five candles that are there lit, and what we have here with these five candles um, represents uh, one concept, one biblical truth uh, for each of them. And uh, just want to advance the slide here so you can see it. You have uh, the first candle we lit was the one of, of hope, then of peace, and then on the other side of joy and love. And tonight it's the Jesus candle. And uh, the scripture says in Matthew 1 21, and she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so we have a, uh, a, a, a prayer that we are going to pray at this time together, um, celebrating the birth of our Savior and the lighting of the Jesus candle. So let's pray this together in unison. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world to become our Savior. Thank you not only that you were born, but also that you died to pay the penalty of our sins. This evening we worship you. Amen. And now we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together as well. Let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a time of singing praise and worship, and I'm going to call upon Mike Jansen and Lori Ben to come and lead us in our time of praise and worship. Mike and Lori. Let's all stand together, please.
because we're limiting our attendance to the required uh, minimum amount, but we are allowed to have cohort groups and the cohort group is downstairs. And so thank you for coming, all of you folks who are downstairs watching that way. We have our scripture reading this evening and we are going to look at, uh, read the passage from Luke chapter two, verses one through 20. It's the New Living Translation and we're gonna read it responsibly, what that means. I will read the part that says, 
leader, and then the verses that it says congregation, you will read together responsibly. So beginning at verse 1 of Luke chapter 2. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their own towns to register for this census. the time came for her baby to be born and she gave birth to her first child a son and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the village inn But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news of great joy for everyone, yeah, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born tonight in Bethlehem in the city of David, and this is how you will recognize him, you will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they ran to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And the shepherds went back to their fields and flocks, glorifying and praising God for what the angels had told them, because they had seen the child just as the angel had said. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word uh, this evening as we have heard the Christmas story uh, as told in the Gospel of Luke. We have the Christmas story for kids, and this is entitled, Jesus is Born. So kids, this one is for you. The story of Christmas, Jesus is born. This is Mary. Hi. You see, Mary was the mother of Jesus, but before that happened, she lived in the town of Nazareth. And she was engaged to marry a man named Joseph. power of God. Wait, huh? Joseph didn't understand all this at first, but an angel came and told him to still take Mary as his wife. Yeah, okay. So he did as the angel said. Not long after that, the ruler of the land, Caesar Augustus, wanted to count how many people were in the land. So Caesar Augustus ordered everyone in the land to travel back to their hometowns so that they could be counted. Joseph's hometown was Bethlehem, so Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they looked for a place to stay. But there was no room for them. So they stayed in a bar, and while they were there, Mary gave birth to Jesus. She wrapped him snugly in the strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. And so the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was born in a barn in Bethlehem. Mm. 
On the night Jesus was born, there were some shepherds in the field keeping watch over their sheep. <sighs> Suddenly, an angel appeared before them, uh -oh. and a bright light shone all around them. <gasps> the shepherds were so scared, but the angel said, Don't be afraid. Uh, okay. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Whoa, what? The angel told the shepherds that they would find Jesus in a barn, wrapped in strips of cloth, laying in a manger. Okay. Then the angel was joined by many, many other angels, and all of them sang, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Then the angels returned to heaven. I wonder how about. And the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Yeah. So they hurried to the village. And found the baby Jesus laying in the manger. Wow. <laughs> After seeing Jesus, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had told them about the baby Jesus. Everyone who heard the shepherd's story were amazed. Mary made sure she remembered all these things and thought about them often. Then the shepherds went back to their sheep and praised God for all they had seen. The baby was exactly who the angel had told them he was, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Well, there you have it. Jesus is born. That's for all of you kids, and all of us, I think, are kids at heart. We enjoy that. Um, we want just to announce a couple of things. And first of all, just uh, for your information, the new regulations that just came out this week from our province uh, allow us for a maximum of 25 people in church services. We are allowed here in this building to have two cohorts of 25. And so we are running with two services on Sundays now, uh, one at 9.30, one at 11.00. And uh, we require, uh, if you sign up for the service of your choice, by calling or emailing the church. And the Sunday services will now be live streamed as well as this service is currently being live streamed. The Sunday uh, will be the uh, 26th Boxing Day, and we will have a service both, as I said, 9.30 and 11 a.m. And I'll be dealing in the final message in my series that I'm looking at the people of Christmas. And in this case, looking at Simeon and Anna who are both seen there in Luke chapter 2 as waiting for the coming king. And then we have a Christmas project, and that is the Jesus Well. You can see at the front of the church here the uh, pump that uh, Mike Jansen has uh, put together for us as a symbol of this. And I understand we are close to $1,000 in our uh, receipts so far. And if you have, uh, if the Lord has laid upon your heart to, to contribute to this, uh, this Sunday will be the final Sunday, so you still have an opportunity to do so this Sunday morning uh, here uh, at the um, church. At this time, we're going to call upon Mike and Lori to come back and to lead us in another song of praise and worship at Christmas time. Oh 
Please be seated. Once again, thank you, Mike and Lori, for leading us in that time of singing one of the old favorite uh, Christmas carols of the season, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Well, this, this evening I have a question I want to start with, and that's to ask you, did you get all your Christmas shopping done? Did everybody buy my present? Is it uh, wrapped up and ready to go? I'm, I'm assuming it, my office is probably full by now, and I'm looking forward to that at the end of the service. Perhaps you heard about the fellow who went to the... Uh, uh, was in court just before Christmas and the judge was in a merry mood and he asked the prisoner and he said and what are you charged with and the fellow said doing my Christmas shopping early and uh, the judge said to him well that's no offense uh, he said how early were you doing the shopping and the fellow said before the store opened well I think one of the main attractions of the Christmas season is because it centers around a baby and I'm sure you agree with me that we all like babies. As a matter of fact, we just love them. Uh, they are gifts from God to us, indeed the perfect gift. Uh, they can sleep on almost any place. Uh, but not all babies are necessarily happy, and indeed some can even look mean. And then you have some who need a lot of support, even if it's from the dogs. And uh, then there are other babies who don't even care for dogs. You can see this young fellow here is definitely not impressed by his dog. And uh, there are others who have real problems with their cat and um, enjoying, not enjoying uh, what the cat has done, in this case, to the paint being spilled all over. Uh, I think that's a little girl there. And some are into world news at an early age, while others are into drumming. Uh, some have parts of their body that grow disproportionately fast, whether it's their teeth or even their legs. And then some have to start shaving at a very early age, while others begin their careers as software engineers early. But uh, last, uh, last but not least, and maybe you didn't know, but this is how babies are delivered. There you go. There you go. Well, the Christmas experience <coughs> surrounds that of a baby. And so, as a result of that, once a year, for about a month or so, millions of people, probably billions of people all around the world, set aside their regular routines that they're involved in, and they get together for a festive round of singing, decorating, shopping, giving and receiving, cooking meals, having family gatherings, except, of course, during a time of a pandemic and some of these things have been severely restricted this year but over the previous years that has happened and when we ask why they get together like this and celebrate and all do, that they do the answer is simply the birth of a baby as it says in our uh, in the scripture reading we read earlier on Luke chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 while they were there the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn a son and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And so tonight we're going to look at this baby who was born over 2,000 years ago and uh, for whom this celebration that we now call Christmas is all about. And I've entitled my message this evening, uh, we're continuing our series, The People of Christmas, Jesus the Son of God, coming to do his Father's will. And as we begin... I want us to pray and ask God's blessing upon our service. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can celebrate at this time of year the birth of our Savior, Jesus. Thank you that he came to Bethlehem and was born as a little baby. Even though he had existed from eternity past as the eternal Son of God, and yet he entered the human race, he became one of us so that he could identify with us, so that he could take upon himself the burden of our sins and bear it and pay its penalty. And so that we could be forgiven by having our faith and trust put in Jesus, believing in him that he died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins. And we're so thankful for that. That's what we really celebrate tonight. Uh, everything else is just uh, extras because the most important thing is that Jesus came into this world, paid the penalty for our sins to give us eternal life. And we thank you for that marvelous gift. We pray this in Jesus' name, for his honor and glory. Amen. Thank you. 
Sunday school program had been um, put together and all the parts had been handed out for the Christmas concert for the kids. Uh, this was a number of years ago and a young boy was very upset, one of the younger boys in, in the Sunday school because he, he wanted to play the role of Joseph in the play and uh, instead they gave him the job of being the innkeeper. And so he came up with an idea that he would get revenge uh, uh, for this. And during the play, when Mary and Joseph came into the inn, uh, instead of turning them around, he said to Mary and Joseph, why yes, we have lots of room, come on in. Well, this change in the script really uh, caught the boy who was playing the part of Joseph off guard and he didn't know this was totally different than what they had practiced but he was up to it and maybe that's why he got the part of Joseph and he walked past the innkeeper and he said to him this place is a mess I can't let my wife stay in a filthy place like this he said come on Mary I'd rather sleep in a barn than in this place well that's the way that young boy took that uh, experience of being rejected from the role that he really wanted to have. But I want to ask the question tonight is who was that baby that slept in a barn after he was born? Uh, and of course we all know that the birth of, that we celebrate is that of Jesus Christ who was born in first, in first century Israel. He was actually born in a very small and insignificant village of Bethlehem. It wasn't quite as insignificant as perhaps, uh, I was thinking afterwards, maybe I shouldn't have used that word, because it was the birthplace in the whole town of David, who was one of Israel's greatest kings, but still, it wasn't a large town, it wasn't uh, um, like Jerusalem, the big city, uh, and it says in Matthew 2, 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, so it's about 4 BC that Jesus was born. And he grew up in another very insignificant village, the village of Nazareth. And we read in Matthew 2 that, uh, talking about Joseph, that says, He got up, took the child and his mother, went to the land of Israel. This is when they were uh, in Egypt. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So when they returned from Egypt, they lived and moved to, back to Nazareth and lived there. Well, Jesus, as a man, became what we today would call probably an itinerant preacher. And he went around from place to place to place. Uh, uh, he uh, preached uh, in community after community after community. After I retired for the first three years of my life, I was doing that. I remember counting up the number of times I spoke in the first couple of years after my retirement. I think I was spoken uh, over 200 times in uh, 60 different communities from uh, BC all the way across through to and including Quebec. Every, a lot of the communities, and I was an itinerant preacher for that period of time, and I tell you, three years is enough of that, um, and that's why I'm glad Linda and I settled into the church here in Toulon after that, but in Jesus' case, he was doing that, and he went around teaching, and of course, um, uh, doing all the good things that he did, and Matthew records Jesus' ministry this way, Jesus went out through Gal throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them, and large crowds followed him. Well, that was his ministry, and then at the age of 33, he met with an, an ignominious death. He was executed on a cross, the common form of capital punishment in the first century Roman Empire. In Luke 23, verse 33, puts it this way, and when they came to the place which is called Calvary, that's actually the Latin form of the Hebrew word Golgotha. And there they crucified him. And of course, that was the picture that we have of this baby and his subsequent life today. But if you dig deeper into the scriptures, you'll discover there's a lot more. And that is the point that I want to establish this evening is this, that unlike you and I, who began our existence at our births, Jesus did not. And uh, looking at the PowerPoint there, um, I don't know if the bomb bombers won the Great Cup the year I was born, but they had to because they probably were just as good as they were this year. I'm, I'm sure they almost did, um, but I, I can't really prove that. I didn't look it up to tell you the honest truth. Well, as I said, unlike you and me, Jesus did not begin his existence when he was born in the manger in Bethlehem. He even, didn't even begin it at his conception in the virgin's womb in Nazareth. 
And the fact is that he had always existed from eternity past. And we read in John 1, verses 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, when it talks about the Word, that phrase, and in Greek it's the Greek word halagos, then literally translated the Word, it's explained for us in verse 14 of John 1. And the Word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. So you know that the word here is referring to a person. And when it's talking about made flesh, it means before he came into the world, was born as a baby, he had already existed in eternity past. And he came, and John says, he made his dwelling among us. He lived in Nazareth. He rubbed shoulders with the people of Nazareth. He was a carpenter working in their midst. And so, this was a reference to Jesus. And so therefore, you can read John 1, 1 in this way. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God. And then the next phrase, Jesus was God. And there you get an idea who this person, this baby is. He's God who became man. And it goes on to say in verse 2, he, referring to Jesus, was with God in the beginning. So his pre-existence, he lived from eternity past until he entered human history in 4 BC, being born in Bethlehem. Now, Jesus had always been with God from eternity past, enjoying an uninterrupted fellowship with him. Jesus often talked about that experience. For example, in John 8, 26, we read, uh, Jesus said, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable. He's talking about his father here. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. And you have this idea previous to his existence in uh, being born in Bethlehem and living on earth, he had had communication, a relationship with his heavenly father. Uh, John 17, Jesus put it this way, and I have brought you glory on earth. He's talking to his father. This is what we call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So you have here the picture of who Jesus was. He existed from eternity past, and being born, he entered human history. None of us had that experience. You did not exist prior to your conception. You started at your conception. Jesus was pre-existent. Um, Beth Barnett puts it this way. He walked down the quiet way of light. Some of his servants were in a group singing and happily working. He smiled. It was a sorrowful smile. The kind you smile when you're filled with both sadness and joy. He could not keep from having joy, and yet he was remorseful. He knew that it would seem like he had never left as soon as he returned, but he didn't want to leave his father. So close were they that they did nothing apart from each other. He took one last look kissed his father goodbye, bid all his servants farewell for a time, and then quietly and purposefully, and with much love vibrating through his heart, he walked into time. And then she concludes with the statement, it was his hour to be born. Well, the second question I'll ask this evening is this. Why did Jesus come to earth to be born in a barn among sheep, cattle, and donkeys? And the answer is this, that he came in obedience to his Father's will. Because you see, it was there in heaven in that pre-existent state that he and the Father had determined that it would be Jesus who would leave heaven and come to earth and become a human being. 1 John 4, 14 says, Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent the Son. And so God the Father said to Jesus, God the Son, go into the world. And so Christmas really is about Jesus leaving heaven and coming to earth and being born in Bethlehem, God who became man, God who is with us, Emmanuel, as we read at the beginning of the service. Galatians 4.4 4 says, And when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And when Jesus came, he came in obedience to his Father's will. Hebrews 10.5-7 says, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. 
with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. And the picture here Hebrews has is of Jesus describing what he was going through, what he was thinking, perhaps even when he was a baby in the manger. I don't know at what point in time, but it says that this is what Jesus said. And he's talking to his father and he talks about the fact that God had prepared for him a body. And that body was the one that was placed in the manger by Mary after he was born. Now, when Jesus came to earth, the scripture says that he emptied himself. Philippians 2 puts it this way, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he didn't hang on for any, at any cost to remaining in heaven. And then it goes on to say what his decision was. And he made himself nothing. In other words, leaving heaven's glory and coming to earth, it says he became nothing and taking the very nature of a servant. He wasn't born in a palace as a great king. He was born in a barn. And it says, and being made in human likeness. And so the picture here is of the most wonderful situation that he could have ever had. And that is all set aside willingly and he takes upon himself the experience of being born as a baby. That must have been an incredible experience for him. Just imagine, one moment you are in heavenly glory, and you are there, and the angels all around the throne worshiping and praising you, together with your heavenly Father. Perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect love, everything perfect, you're there. And then the next moment, you are a multiplying cell in your mother's body. C.S. Lewis has given us a parallel that you can imagine what it must have meant for Jesus to do this when he puts it this way. If you want to get the hang of it, think of how you would like to become a slug or a crab. That would be your and my parallel experience, leaving our bodies and the next thing, we are a worm crawling along the ground. And that is the experience of what Jesus went through. Jesus humbled himself. Um, written here, a statement in uh, Max Lucado's book. He puts it this way. Jesus humbled himself. He went from commanding angels to sleeping in the straw. From holding stars to clutching Mary's finger, the palm that held the universe took the nail of a soldier. Why? Because that's what love does. The gift of God, the birth of Christ. And then Blacado concludes, this is Christmas, this is love. Someone has put it this way, God must like people. He sent his son to be one. Now this event was celebrated by the angels. It was celebrated first in heaven. Luke 1 says, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let the angels worship him. And so you have, as Jesus is being born, there's a big celebration in heaven at that point in time. And all of heaven is celebrating this magnificent move of God, the incarnation. And then later on earth, as we've already seen earlier on in our scripture reading, the angels are celebrating, as it says in Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and 14, and suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Can you imagine the celebration that the angels had over this awesome event? That's why we celebrate tonight. We following the pattern that the angels set for us. I'll never forget riding in my car. I was driving my car in Estevan, Saskatchewan in July uh, 1969. July the 21st, 1969. And uh, I had to kind of weave the car through the dinosaurs that were crossing the road at that point in time. It was so long ago. And uh, I remember as I was driving uh, my six, I had a 63 Chevy Impala Super Sport that I was really proud of. As a, I was uh, 19 years old at that time and just, um, you know, just. Uh, all the girls were so impressed by my car, I hope. And so I was uh, driving through the streets of Esteban. I had my radio on in my car. Uh, I was actually a counselor at Esteban Bible Camp that particular week. And it was a Sunday. 
and I had gone up to get some ice cream or something before the next week of camp was to start. And I remember listening to the news and talking about how the uh, man had landed on, um, on the moon. And um, a couple of, uh, a day or so later, Richard Nixon, who was the president of the United States of America at that point in time, made this statement and he said, and I quote, this planting of human feet on the moon is the greatest moment in human history. And of course, it was an amazing experience, uh, the fact that they walked on the moon back then. I like what Billy Graham said shortly thereafter. He followed it up by putting it this way. He said, the greatest moment in human history was not when man set foot on the moon, but rather when the infinite and eternal God set foot on earth in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Greatest as putting your foot on the moon, uh, one step for mankind, one giant leap for humankind, uh, as, as, as the astronaut said, the greater thing was God coming to earth. But Jesus' life was uh, characterized by obedience to the Father's will all along. In uh, John chapter uh, 8, verse 29, it says, uh, he says to the people, the one who has sent me is with me and he has not deserted me for I always do those things that are pleasing to him. Now, I wish I could say that about myself because the fact of the matter is, I'll let you know, I don't always do those things that are pleasing to him and I know you don't either. None of us do, nobody about the thousand. And all of us fail at one point or another in our lives. But Jesus was constantly and perfectly and totally obedient to his father's will. We see that obedience and his willingness to get baptized in Matthew 3, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you do you come to me? And Jesus said, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. The baptism John had was a baptism of repentance. Jesus had nothing to repent over, but he wanted to set example for us that we too should follow in baptism, and he wanted to be the first to set that pattern for each of us. And so it says, and so John baptized him. And then, of course, his final great act of obedience was his death on the Roman cross. And Philippians 2 puts it this way, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, um, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Somebody's made up a story and put it this way. I'll read it for you. It's a make-believe story. It's, it's not a true story, but it, it, it has a good, good point. One day, a spaceship landed in the middle of a field just outside a small rural community. The aliens looked friendly enough, so some farmers cautiously approached them, hoping to establish a good relationship with them. The aliens greeted the Earthlings warmly and said, We are on a mission from the planet Zuron of the galaxy Andromeda. We have been assigned to explore your planet to discover what you've learned. We are here to learn as much as we can about planet Earth. So tell us, has anything significant happened here on Earth that you can tell us about? The farmers thought for a moment, then one spoke up and said, well, we have radio and TV. We can send radio and microwave signals all over the planet using satellites. Well, the aliens replied, oh, well, we have had that for thousands of years. In fact, that technology has become quite obsolete. What else has happened? Again, the farmers scratched their heads and one said, we have developed computers that can process information in seconds that used to take years. And these computers are small enough to be carried in a briefcase or even on a phone. Oh, that's old news too, said the aliens. Hasn't anything extraordinary happened here before? The farmers were still thinking when one of the aliens asked, we have heard a rumor that God visited your planet many years ago. Is this rumor true? They asked. The farmers scratched their heads again and said, well, there was a man named Jesus Christ. Well, the one of the aliens responded, what an extraordinary thing. What a wonderful thing. Tell us, what did you do when God visited your planet? Did you bring gifts and throw them at his feet? Did you run the streets celebrating and singing? Please tell us, what did you do? And again, the farmers very quietly pondered for a moment and then sheepishly said, we killed him. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, death on the cross was God's solution to our sin problem. Because you see, our first parents, Adam and Eve, in disobedience to God's express will, had chosen freely to eat one of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God had forbidden. And as a result, sin entered the human race. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death has come 
to all men because all have sinned. And that, punish, that sin deserved the punishment of death. It's, uh, when, when Jesus died, he says, for the wages of sin is death. You see, the problem in your life and mine is this. Our sin separates us from God. It's like a great big in, impassable divide between us and him. And, and it's impossible to get from one side to the next. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. But Jesus' death spans the divide and brings us to God. As Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. And so here's the good news. So when we come to him, he accepts us. He completely forgives us of our sins and gives us the gift of eternal life. The wages of sin is death. We looked at that verse already. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And tonight as this Christmas Eve service draws to a close, I have a question to ask you, and that is this. Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you opened the door of your life? As Jesus put it in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. And right now, tonight, Jesus is standing outside the door of your life. And he wants to come in. No, he's God. He can push his way open and come in and say, I'm taking over. But he doesn't. He waits for you to open the door. And when you open the door, he comes in. And you experience eternal life. The forgiveness of sins. You experience God in you. John 1.12 says, And he was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Talk, talking about the Jewish nation. But as many as received him, you see here the option, as many who choose to, to them gave you the right to become children of God, to those that believe on his name. And this evening I would encourage you to open the door of your heart. Believe in Jesus. Ask him to come into your heart. You can pray a prayer like this. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I'll ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and become my Savior. Thank you for coming into my life. And if you pray that prayer and sincerely mean it, I can assure you Jesus Christ will come into your heart and into your life and become your Savior. In 2001, Patricia Durant, age 26, was two-thirds of her way through her pregnancy when she learned she was suffering from acute myeloid leukemia. And uh, she writes her experience in this way. It was terrifying, she recalled. I was afraid for the baby. I was afraid of dying and there, not being there for my daughter. It was very stressful and difficult for my family. And when she, she did not respond to moderate doses of, of chemotherapy, the doctors induced labor at 26 weeks and so that then they could give her the chemotherapy and it wouldn't hurt her baby. Well, on September the 2nd, 2001, uh, Victoria was born healthy weighing three and a half pounds and two months premature. Baby Victoria was placed in an incubator while um, Mrs. Durant renewed her chemotherapy. And Patricia was given only six months to live. By March, uh, Mrs. Durant was so ill that the doctors at Royal Victoria Hospital could wait no longer for a suitable donor for bone marrow transplant. And so at that point in time, the doctors decided to take some of the stem cells from the blood of her daughter's umbilical cord and to use that for a transplant. And the Montreal Gazette puts it this way, the stem cells also flooded Mrs. Durant's bloodstream and stuck to her bone marrow, the part of the body that manufactures the blood, and began rebuilding her blood system. And the stem cells also destroyed residual cancer cells. And seven months after the infusion, Mrs. Durant is in complete remission. Well, the doctor who treated her told the paper this is the best case scenario we could have possibly imagined. From the doctor's point of view, the chances are that she's cured. Well, here's a picture of her several years later with Patricia Durant in full remission. And uh, she says this of her baby daughter. She saved her mommy. She's a little miracle. And that's why we name her Victoria Angel. She's my little angel. She's my miracle. I mean, I gave birth to this wonderful child, this miracle who then saved my life. It's just an unbelievable story, said Patricia Durant. Well, the same kind of miracle can happen to you when you accept Jesus into your life.
Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have this evening to be here this uh, time and to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Thank you that Jesus came into the world, died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins so we could be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. And I pray if there's someone here tonight who has not yet accepted Christ, that they will take that step and open the door of their, their hearts and receive Christ into their lives and make him their personal Savior. And we, we pray that the birth of Jesus will indeed make the uh, tremendous impact on their lives as it has on the rest of us, those who have already taken that step. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, this evening I would challenge you, if you have not yet received Christ as Savior, would you do that? Would you take that step right now? Would you pray that prayer I had earlier on on the PowerPoint? Would you pray quietly in your heart and say something like this, Dear Jesus, thank you for coming into this world. Thank you for being born. And thank you for dying on the cross. I confess my sins to you. I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and become my Savior. Now, if you pray that prayer and sincerely mean it, Jesus will come into your life. Father, we thank you for this message we can proclaim this Christmas. Bless it to our hearts and lives. In Christ's name we pray. We're going to have our final song, and with that, our Christmas Eve service is over. I'm going to call Mike and Lori to come at this time. Stand again. Eve service with that wonderful uh, Christmas uh, carol, silent night. 
This, uh, the angel said to Joseph, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Isn't it wonderful to have your sins forgiven as a gift of eternal life? Thanks for watching the service, those of you who have been online. Thanks for those of you who are here in person. God bless you, and I wish you a very, very Merry Christmas.